So we're going to be looking at verse um, 14 tonight, or actually 13, and then we will finish off the rest of the chapter in Psalm 71. And, you know, as I was looking at one of the references that I'm going to use in this psalm, it's, it's in Psalm 45, and, and so I'm flipping back, you know, through the psalms, and I start to pay attention to how many psalms we have left. And I'm just like, wow, we haven't even broke into book three yet. I mean, there's, there's still a whole lot of psalms we have. And I started thinking, I wonder how many more Sunday nights we have. Well, we'll probably won't finish the psalms. Maybe Christ will come back before then. Amen? Yeah. So, <laughs> so anyways, that always, should always be a good amen. But um, the psalms are just an awesome, awesome, um, you know, just collection of songs and poems and prayers that really, guys, highlight who God is for Israel as a nation and for priests and for kings and for um, individuals in general. So this is what's so great about the book of Psalms as you kind of do your study through the Psalms and we have is we found so many people from different um, you know, aspects of life and different backgrounds and having different relationships with God and yet we see that, one, they're all in need of God moving on behalf of their life, but then we also see that their faith is so strong in the Lord. And these psalms are not written because of new experiences in people's lives. These psalms are written because these people have experience with God in their life. And so this is the result of individuals uh, you know, writing as a result of, of God's faithfulness and goodness in their lives. And no matter the severity of the psalm, because some of these psalms have very, you know, dire situations, and some of them are to the point of death and despair, but yet you always see the psalm begin to kind of build up as they put their focus upon the Lord, and ultimately the psalm will end with this great praise or exhortation of the name of the Lord. So this is kind of what we have been looking at um, now in Psalm 71, and this is our third Sunday night in this psalm. So it's taken us three Sundays, and I believe tonight we'll finally finish it. So typically the introduction to every psalm takes an entire service, at least 45 minutes of introduction. And then what we do is we then begin to start. Why? Because a couple of things you want to understand is the backdrop. So for the time that we have tonight, we're going to just consider the backdrop just for a little bit. That way we remember uh, the author of the psalm, and uh, clearly the nature of the psalm. So two things that played a big factor in this psalm, or actually three for that matter, and it's the first one is this is a psalm that is written that the author is unknown. So remember that we have uh, been looking at the psalms that have been written by David, who was the king of Israel, and David wrote a lot of the psalms in the book of Psalms, and we've also seen other psalms written by the sons of Korah, which were Levites, so to speak. And their psalms kind of have highlights and overtones of praises and worship in the, and sacrifices in the temple and the tabernacle of the Lord, if you will. And so what we see here in Psalm 71 is there's no actual author that has been credited to writing this psalm. What we do know is that in reading the psalm, we get a little bit of insight as to perhaps who the author is. Right off the top, what we do know for sure is that the author has a relationship with the Lord. And so we know that even though the author is unknown, that's the first thing we can get clear with this psalm. And without the author being known, we don't really, nor can we place this psalm in a particular time in someone's life. Like if we're reading David's psalm, most of the time we can put it within David's life in some period in his life. And then we can actually go back to the story of King David and read the account in which surrounded the writing of the psalm. And that's always a good thing to do. But with this psalm here, what we found out to be true in regards to this psalm is that there's so many other psalms quoted just in this one psalm alone. And so a lot of various psalms, and we looked at all those verses that pertain to where we can see other psalms. So it would seem that the author was also very familiar with the scriptures. That the author of this psalm knew the writings and have found comfort within the psalms in general. So we see familiarity with this unknown author and his relationship with the Lord and his familiarity with the scriptures 
of the Lord. But then we also, the second thing we see is that this psalmist is not a young person. It's an older person. And the reason why we kind of took some time to consider that, because remember in Psalm chapter 70, though it's only five verses, this is a psalm of David. The introduction of the title of the psalm says a psalm of David. And that's why it has led many to believe that perhaps Psalm 71 is really a continuation of Psalm 70. Remember that initially when these psalms were written, there was no chapter in verses. That was later inserted. And so this is why some believe that perhaps Psalm 71 really is a continuation of Psalm 70. Why? Because in Psalm 70, David is an older man writing Psalm chapter 70. And then you have the same psalm that David wrote. Actually, this is a, if you will, a carbon copy, if I can put it that way, of another psalm that David wrote in Psalm 70. David wrote also Psalm chapter 40. And verses 13 through 17 are the same as Psalm 70. But the difference between Psalm 40 and Psalm 70 is that David was a young man in Psalm 40. And now David's an older man in Psalm 70. And we see the difference within the psalm of David's writing as an older man. We see more maturity, more patience, more wisdom. So for those of you, don't worry. Don't get discouraged if you're getting old. Patience and wisdom comes with older age. Hopefully it does. Let's pray that it does. Put it that way. But in Psalm 70, this is why many believe that perhaps this could have been a psalm of David and but I don't think this is because the psalmist, the author here, even though he's older and it would kind of give this, um, you know, same type of feel of Psalm 70 here. The psalmist emphasizes a couple of other things. What we do know is his age and we see it. Remember, in verse six, it says, but you but by you, I have been upheld from birth. Uh, you are he who took me out of my mother's womb. And notice what he says in verse 9. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Look at verse 18. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. So what we do know about Psalm chapter 71 now is that the author is unknown, but he has a relationship with the Lord. You can see by the content of his writing and you also see his familiarity with the scriptures of all the psalms that were the verses we've already studied. The second thing we see is that this psalmist is an older person that is experiencing a time in his life where he is perhaps maybe coming to the end of some type of, in a sense, the writing of the psalm looks like it's the end of his life, but technically it's not. And perhaps some believe that it could be his service. What do I mean by service? Well, if you look at verses 22, 23, and 24, you'll notice what he says in Psalm 71 in those verses. He, he talks about that he will praise the Lord with a lute and with a harp and that he will sing praises unto the Lord. And many believe the third thing that we find out about this author, that perhaps he was one who was a worshiper in the tabernacle of the Lord because the worshipers understood this type of dynamic and how they would praise the Lord. And so the view, I think, is pretty amazing when you consider it that way. So here are a couple of things for us to consider when we look at Psalm 71. And so we know for sure that, one, the author is unknown, obviously. Two, that the author of this psalm is older in age and is writing. And, and the point that I'm making here about verses 22, 23, and 24, about him being a worshiper in the tabernacle of the Lord and understanding the worship of God. Not just everybody understands the worship of God. Remember, worship unto the Lord was taught to God's people. And who were the ones instructed to teach the people to worship? The Levites, the priest, those who were given the charge of worshiping the Lord and offering offerings and sacrifices unto the Lord and so on and so forth. So there was an element of these people in the time of the children of Israel that they were instructed and taught. And remember that it was given, the charge was given to the mothers to teach the children, so on and so forth, the word and the law of God. And there was constant instruction being given. Now the point that's being made is, listen, they first step into their office of being among the worshipers of the Levi at about the age of 25 years old. 
And some also view it as the age of 21, the age where they step into this ministry. The age of 25 is probably more around the age that they step into this ministry, and they serve until they're 50 years old. Now, I'm not saying that 50 years old is an old person, okay? But it's getting there. About 20 years shy. You know, when you get to nothing against the 70s and 80-year-olds, and uh, there's really no 80-year-olds in here, but we have some 70-year-olds getting close there, and, you know, that's, that's, that's older. Let's just say older, more mature. But it's old, man. Let's be real. You know what I mean? But the older have wisdom that can be given to the younger. And you would see that the desire from this older author, his desire is to give his wisdom to the younger. That is like the right attitude to have. So for the older crowd, though we make jokes, and, and we do it all the time here, and I, and I love the uh, you know, a sense of humor that the seasoned saints have in this church, but the reality is, is that you know, the seasoned saints is not some ministry that just you know, you know, have them go to hometown buffet and that'll keep them happy. You know, just, get, just get them out of the way. You don't do that with the older people in the church. And though they do go to hometown buffet, that's, <laughs> we're not doing that to get rid of you, okay? That's you guys are doing that to fellowship. You know how you guys get down, man. You guys fellowship around food, man, and cut the rug with that now, you know? But, but the point I'm trying to make is that your purpose as an older person is really the desire that this man has here, and that is his desire is to pour into the next generation. And I believe that there should be room in every church for that. The, the, the board of elders and, and, and the teaching elders and ruling elders that we have in this fellowship are uh, older people. They are elders, not only elder in position, but elders in age. And I think that that's important. I've tried with young people. And, and young people can be very prideful and very arrogant and, and not have a teachable spirit and, and not willing to serve. They want to be served. And the older crowd has, has already been through all that. And, and uh, you know, one of the things you find, too, is when a church gets rocked, the young people flee. The older people say, we've been here before. We know what we got to do. We got some wisdom and experience in this. And the awesome thing about that is that this has all been because of their relationship with the Lord. And so this, I, I, as I was reading this psalm, uh, this evening I was driving here and I told my wife, I says, do you remember the this, this sermon that we heard about a month ago? Alistair Begg is probably one of my favorite Bible teachers. And uh, he, he says, you got to be crazy for Jesus. I got a kick out of that because I don't normally hear a guy like that say, you got to be crazy for Jesus. What is it to be crazy for Jesus? And I just started thinking that, you know, it's not a matter of just doing anything for Jesus and going out and, and, and drawing attention to yourself, it's willing to give yourself completely for him. That's insanity to others. But you see, a life that has been completely given to the cause of the God of Israel is found here in the life of this individual in this psalm. And so looking at these first 12 verses, we saw that this individual was coming to a head in his life. There was, there was some antagonizing, some persecution, if you will, some coming against, if you will. And remember that he kept saying, you know, Lord, you know, deal with my enemies. So we see that the enemies were real. They were apparent in his life. And guys, listen, every Christian goes through attacks. Every Christian has the enemy or enemies. And whether they be spiritual warfare, whatever the case might be, all these things play a factor in the Christian life. It's something we'll never escape on this side of heaven. But the awesome thing is that we have God's word. And his word is active, it's alive, it's living, it's powerful. And his word transcends every age, every circumstance, situation, trial, or adversity that we face, and we find our hope found within the scriptures that God has given us. So the thing about here is that we see that the psalmist is constantly looking to the power of God. And his hope is found in who God is for him. And I don't think that this psalm is just written with the individual in mind. I think as you read a little bit further in this psalm that you're also going to see that the nation and the people of Israel as a whole are in view. So let's read verses 1 through 12, and I'll just read through it, not exposit that. We've already done it two Sunday nights. 
when we get to verse 13, then we'll begin a verse-by-verse -verse, um, exposition um, of each verse. So it says here in verse 1, your attention please. It says, in you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline your ear to me and save me. And I just want to take this one note that in verse 1 you'll see the first thing that the author starts with is that he is confident that he will not be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness, he says in verse 2. Verse 3, he says, be my strong refuge. Deliverance and the strong refuge is found in the Lord. In other words, be the rock of refuge to which I may resort continually. You have given, you have given the commandment to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O oh my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. Remember I said there was some adversity that he was facing. For you are my hope, O oh Lord. You might want to circle that in verse 5, for you are my hope. You are my trust from my youth. By you I have been upheld from birth. You are he who took me out of my mother's womb. My praise shall be continually of you. I have become... A wonder to many. I love that. He has become a wonder to many. Why? Because in the midst of everything that he's gone through and every circumstance that he's faced in life, the point that he's making here is that he's never let go. And he's been a wonder to many. In other words, people are amazed by his consistent diligence and faithfulness to the Lord God. Do you know, guys, listen tonight, you might be weary. You might be tired. You might be distracted. You might be going through something. You want to know what? You might be sitting here, but you might not be here. And the answer to that is not, well, I'm here, aren't I? No. It's that you're holding on. And because you're here and because you're holding on, when you can be doing everything else, by this very testimony, you become a wonder to everybody else. And that's what trials do and adversity does when you hold on to the Lord. You will either become a wanderer, bouncing around from place to place because you're looking for something to satisfy and help. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to fill a spiritual need with a physical emotion or you will be a wonder and amazement to people. Or they will say, man, I thought they were going to throw in the towel a long time ago. I thought they would have given up already. And yet you hold fast and you trust in the Lord. And this is what and how God gets the glory in the life of every Christian. So every single one of us here tonight, no matter what phase we're in, guys, let me tell you something. If you might think that you're God's gift by being here, you're wrong. It's called divine appointment. Yeah, well, I should have been over here. You should have, could have, but you are not. You're here. Well, I brought myself here. That's what you think. But you're here because the Lord has something for you to hear. It always works that way. It's an awesome thing. But notice here what we see. We are a wonder to people. And so where does the wonder come from? It comes from the work of God in your life, in the circumstances and situations in your life. Then he goes on to say, here I have become a wonder to many, but you are my strong refuge. Let my mouth be filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fails. For my enemies speak against me. This would be, guys, that perhaps he's coming to the end, maybe of his if he is, in fact, one who is a worshiper and in charge of the worship and sacrifices and offerings of the Lord in that dynamic, we see also, too, that perhaps this could be really what's in view here. His time of, of being in the security of the work of the Lord has now coming to an end. And what would happen to those once they're, they reach the age of 50? Well, they were no longer within that dynamic of offering and leading and teaching now they had to live as normal civilians among the people of Israel. And remember, no land was ever given to any of the Levites. None of them received or inherited land. The Bible is very clear with those who were Levites and did work in this type of dynamic. The Bible says that, they would, that the Lord says they are to minister unto me as priest, and I am their inheritance, and that I will be their inheritance. 
And so once they come to this age of now where it's time for them to transition over and now others come in to do the work, well, perhaps maybe there is some truth to what is being said here. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. In other words, my time could be coming, uh, not death, but his time of perhaps moving on from this ministry here that he has given because it is the time of age to do so. Do not forsake me when my strength fails, for my enemies speak against me. In other words, perhaps they could be ridiculing him. Where's your God? Where's your God going to be at once you're done doing what you're doing for him? And that is always the work of the enemy to antagonize us and cause us to question how faithful God really is in our life. Well, can I tell you that this man shouldn't have been worrying? If, in fact, that is the case, he shouldn't have been worrying as, as to what's going to happen after because his future is in God's hands. But it just shows the reality of the depth of this man's heart. This is what's really on my heart here. All of us have insecurities and worries, so to speak, and fears, if we can put them in that term, in our lives where we say, Lord, you know, I don't know what's going to happen five years from now. And, and listen, these are things that are normal. You're not faithless or have no faith or, or this or that. If you think in those dynamics, I mean, to think that way is fine because we ultimately don't know. But what we do know are two things without a doubt. One, that we will be firmly in the palm of his hand. And two, we will be doing the work of the Lord. Those are the two things we will know for sure. At least as a Christian, you'll know those two things, correct? There's no doubt about that. But where you will be economically, where you will be materialistically, where you will be in career-wise or whatever the case might be, those things you don't know. But what we do know is that we are his children. And so... This is kind of what we would say of verses 9 and 10. And he goes on to say in verse 10, For my enemies speak against me, and those who lie in wait for my life take counsel together, saying, God has forsaken him. Pursue and take him, for there is none to deliver him. And I love what he says in verse 12. O oh God, do not be far from me. O oh my God, make haste to help me. Notice something here. We see that his cry is found in the first two words of verse 12. Oh God. His cry is to the Lord God. Do not be far from me, oh my God. And what we see here is a more grand plea. It's more personal. It's greater. He's saying now, oh my God, make haste to help me. And what we see is a desperation. Guys, there's nothing wrong with a desperate prayer, okay? Sometimes it's desperate prayers that really move us to more prayer. You can go from saying, you know, your prayer starts when, when it's not a, a prayer of, of, of great need. It's, it's funny how, have you ever noticed how people pray when it's not a prayer of great need? It's kind of like, dear Heavenly Father. You know, but then when it's a prayer of great need, you're like, oh, God, help me. You know, it's, it's different. It's whole way different. If you've experienced that in your own life, you know exactly what I'm and you're even surprised. Like, did I just say that? You know, yeah, you did. Why? Because it's coming from a different place. It's coming from your heart and your deepest need for God to to meet you right where you are because you have nowhere else to turn but God when you do the cute little dear God you have other things that you can look to and other people that are probably going to help but when all is gone and no one is there to help and it's just you and your circumstance and situation you better believe your prayer ain't going to start off like Matthew chapter 6 our father who art in heaven no way, Jose. That thing's going to change dram dramatically, and it will be dramatic. But God's not up there saying, like you and I would say, you know how you would answer to that. You already know how you are. Come on now. Don't get all spiritual in here. I know how I would answer. Oh, now you want to, oh, my God, you know. You should have been, oh, my God, in the entire time. Look at you, you know. God doesn't do that. God doesn't do that at all whatsoever. I'm so thankful that he's not like us. Amen? Amen. But what he does do regardless of the way you start your prayer and the introduction to it, the ultimate thing is that you know who you're praying to. We know who we're praying to. You know what else is amazing? Two things about prayer. You ready for this? One, you know who you're praying to. And two, the one whom you're praying to hears you. 
That's all that should ever be written on prayer. I mean, so many books written on prayer, kind of like the <laughs> dynamic of this morning, so many books written on fasting, so many books written on prayer, and the two things you need to be assured of in prayer is, one, you know who you're praying to, and you know that he hears you when you pray. That is so awesome. People want more than that. For me, that's enough. That's enough. Oh God, do not let or do not be far from me. Oh my God, make haste to help me. Now look at verse 13. Now we're going to pick it up verse by verse as now we go through these verses here. Let me be confound let them be confounded and consumed who are adversaries of my life. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor who seek my hurt. Notice what he does now. He makes Requests And the two requests that he makes is this. Notice this. When he says, let them be confounded. You know, listen. What he's doing here is he's clearly, when he's praying this request and he's saying, let them be confounded. The word confounded is the word ashamed. Some translations of yours will say, let them be ashamed. Remember in verse 1 of chapter 71, what was his confidence in? That he will not be put to shame. But his enemies, he's saying, let them be put to shame. The contrast that he's giving is, listen, those who are the children of God will never be put to shame, but the enemies of God will always be put to shame. So here's the point I guess we could make, and, and let's kind of make this insertion as clearly as we possibly can. Not only is this a request, but guys, listen, sometimes our prayers are prophetic. And they are. In a sense, this prayer and this request here is, is prophetic. The enemies will be put to shame. There's dynamics in prayer, guys, that I think is important for us to really pay attention to how we pray sometimes. And so what we see here is that he says, here's his request. Let them be confounded. Let them be put to shame. And notice what he says here. Those who are the adversaries of my life. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor who seek my hurt. So we see here that these verses declare that which only God can do. And that is defeat the enemy, bring them to shame. And so one way to pray is to pray that the work of the enemy works against them. And you can pray that. When the enemy comes against you and, 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 and now you're going through what you're going through and as you start to pray in regards to the work of the enemy and you see that it's pressing in on every side, whether it's individuals or just the enemy itself, you can pray that prayer. Say, Lord, let the enemy be confused. Let their plans against me come to confusion and let them be taken in by their own plans against me. And so this is what he's doing. He's praying this very prayer, this request, if you will, but yet, what we see here, ultimately, this is what does happen to God's enemy and the enemies of God's people. Look at verse 14. But I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. I love verse 14. Rather than slip into despair and discouragement and depression. Rather than allowing his trials and his adversity that he's facing to consume him and overpower, you know, his ability to, to function regularly, what does he do? Rather than resorting to despair, he resorts to praise. It's a big thing about praise when you're going through trials and adversity, guys. But notice what he's doing. I don't know if you've taken note of this, but remember I told you earlier in verse 5 to circle what word? What word did I ask you to circle? The word hope. Why is this important? Well, notice something here in verse 14. What does he say? But I will hope continually and praise you. Why is this any different than verse 5? Well, I'll tell you, when you look at these two words, you read them in the original English language and you see the word hope, but they're actually not the same words in the original language. As a matter of fact, the hope that we see in verse 5 is the word hope, but it's the Hebrew word tikal, which has the idea of expectation, this, this, this confident expectation, 
But, but that's really the idea behind it. Not that it's a bad hope. It's good hope. It's hope in the Lord. Obviously, and it's a good hope, but it's an expectation. And then we see here, this hope in verse 14 is a little bit different. This Hebrew word for the word hope is yakal. And yakal is a little bit different in the idea that, notice what he says here, but I will hope continually. In other words, this hope is confident expectation, but this hope is to wait patiently. I will continue to wait patiently. It has the idea of hoping not just for one thing at one particular time and having confidence in the Lord for one particular thing, as I know my hope is in the Lord that he'll meet this need. Remember, that need is just one need, right? But the hope of verse 14 is a little bit different. And the reason why I want to highlight this is you could see why now in verse 14 it's different than verse 5. The prayer begins to change. You see, the more time you begin to think upon what God... I mean, just consider this tonight, guys. What has God really done for you individually as a person? What has God done for you that only you and Him know about? What is it that God has delivered? How far has God reached? And I'll tell you what. You might have a long list, and you might not even really have that much on the list. But if you were to look at God's list versus your list... Every time the Lord has spared your life and every time God has met your need and every time the Lord has come through without you even knowing it because he's God. And God doesn't parade himself and say, hey, I just want to let you know you almost got killed, but I took care of it, all right? <laughs> Imagine if the Lord let you know every moment of every day that, you know, listen, you guys might just think, well, you know, man, imagine how many cars I could have been hit by walking down the street, especially crossing the street here at Living Way. It's true. But here you know what's even more crazy? Check this out. How often do you think God perhaps has dissolved blood clots in your own body? How often has God healed you without you even knowing that you were in need of healing and you didn't even know what your need was and he healed you before you even prayed about it because you were probably going to have a brain aneurysm and die? How many times has God spared you from having a massive heart attack while sitting down watching TV or perhaps even in the midst of some horrible sin? And it's only by the graces of God that every moment, every second, every microsecond of our lives we're spared and we're redeemed only because of the grace of God and because of His faithfulness. And now when you want to say you're thankful for something, stop looking at your petty little list and trying to remember everything God has done for you and just think, just because He's God, I'm thankful. Because without Him, I'm nothing. And really, we can look at this psalm and be encouraged by what this psalmist is saying and saying, wow, the Lord has done a lot for you. But let me tell you something. If we only had full knowledge of what God has really done for us completely from beginning to end, we have a glimpse of the cross. We've embraced the cross. We've received the work of the cross. But do you truly understand at what great length the cross really costs? I think that day will happen when we see the lamb as though it had been slain. The realization will come to fruition in the mind of, of every person and, and it will come to a greater understanding when we stand before the Christ who gave himself for us. And then we'll realize there. But if that is that confident expectation and that confidence hope, that, that hope that we are looking to, why can't we have a glimpse of it on this side of heaven and begin to focus our lives to live for Christ now? And knowing that I might not fully comprehend all the blessings and the dividends that come along with being a Christian, what I do know is that I am no longer on my way to hell. But how often, guys, really think about it. If you were to say, wow, God saved my life like two times, man. One time I was in a car accident. You know, I think like this. See, a lot of you people don't know, I was in a horrific car accident. I hit a tree at over 100 miles an hour. You guys don't know this. And we should have been dead. The vehicle that we were in was a brand new vehicle. The motor was in the front seats where we were sitting. Everything in the back seat ripped right through the back seats. My brother Chris was in the back. and Don't worry, my mom wasn't drunk driving. But it was a horrific accident. 
and the Lord spared our lives. And now I know why. That's just one incident. Multiple times over. You guys have no clue. I was just with this man the other evening as we're driving and we're on a particular street and I said, this street, I was probably about 11 years old and my brother was probably about 12 or 13 and we were in a vehicle that was shot multiple times and neither one of us were hit. I was just a kid. And driving down that street every time, I says, the Lord saved my life right here. You see, there's moment after moment, and I'll tell you what, those can be those, the, those moments and those highlights in my life. Why did God spare me and not another person? Why couldn't he have spared a person better than me? I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. But what I do know is that I think all of us have been spared in ways that you and I cannot even imagine. And the interesting thing is that those moments didn't even draw me closer to the Lord. If anything, they drew me further away from the Lord. And it's now that you and I realize as we look back of all the things that the Lord has done in our lives, right? And then we are wowed, but the Lord is like, if you really only knew. Moment by moment, day by day. And that's why I love what the Bible says and Jesus says in John 10, those whom the Father has given me, none can pluck them out of my hand. We are secure, we are safe in the palm of the Lord God. And our time is not up until the Lord says it's up. And that is a hope also, right? Because that means that we're going to what? See him face to face. So while life and tragedies and trials and adversity, guys, and people or circumstances, situations, sicknesses and diseases come against us and become the trial and the adversity in our lives. And you might think sickness and disease does not threaten or does not say to you, I'm going to kill you. Yes, it does. Every moment and every second of that disease in you does that. So it's all the same. The difference is. The one who is being trialed by these things, whether they are in Christ or not. He says, I will hope continually. I will look back. I will, I will, no matter the circumstance or situation, notice what it says here. I will continue. It means there is a waiting. There is, it's constant. It's continual. And this is what he's saying, to wait and to be patient. You know, it's hard to be patient when you're waiting on the Lord, right? And he says, and I will praise you yet more and more. Wow. So this hope in his trial and in our trials, you ready for this, guys? This hope in our trials actually works for us, not against us. You know that trials, remember we talked about trials serving the purpose in, in the lives of an individual. Trials actually work for you, not against you. So... Maybe that's, for some of you, need to take note of that tonight. They work for you, not against you. When somebody's going through a trial, right away, the first thing you think of is, what did I do wrong, right? And God, why am I in trouble? Why, why couldn't you, you know, attack my wife or something? Man, you know, you got to attack me, you know? It's like, right away, you already want to throw it on someone else, you know? It's like, well, look at that person. They're always happy in the church. You attack them, Lord. Let them get one, you know what I mean? And, but listen, all of us have our trials and our adversities, right? All of us do. And if you're sitting here tonight and you're saying, well, you know, all these people just need prayer because I don't have these trials. Well, I want to learn your method. Because if you don't have trials, I think you need to take inventory of your heart and really evaluate it. Because trials work for you, not against you. So the hope that trials bring is a hope that leads to glory. Did you guys know that? Let me read to you out of 1 Corinthians. I want to just get this to you guys before we move on. And in 1 Corinthians, we find the very purpose of this or these trials in our own personal lives. In verse 4, the Bible talks about this, these type of trials in our lives and how you know, they work out for our good. 
And, and notice what it says in chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians in verses 16 through 18. It says this, Therefore I urge you, imitate me. For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Now some are puffed up, coming as though I had not coming to you, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills, and I will know that the word of those who are puffed up, but the power for the kingdom is of God is not in word, but in power. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love and a spirit of gentleness? So we see here that Paul has a care and an, and, and, and an encouragement for the people as Paul himself has, for the moment, been trialed by adversity in his own life. But what is he saying here? That it is the power of God. It's the power of God that sustains us. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but it is in power. And trials serve a purpose in our life, and we have the ability to walk in the very power of God. And what's interesting in the very power that Paul is speaking about, he also talks in Romans chapter 5, in verses 1 through 5, in regards to this very same thing, in regards to the very power of God, but overcoming in trials and tribulations because it is the very power of God by the work of His Spirit that produces character and perseverance in us. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into the grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory. Now notice that there's glory that's received when one goes through trials. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The very power of God today for the Christian guys is the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. So in one case, we see Paul saying, listen, though trialed by many things, he says, listen, it's the kingdom of God is not just in word, but it's in power. And the power that we have, according to uh, Romans chapter 5, is really as a result of our trials and tribulations that we have in our lives. And, and what are these trials and tribulations in our lives that we, you and I experience? Well, Romans chapter 5, what does he say? It produces all kinds of things that benefit us. But we have the very Spirit of God. We have hope in the Lord. There is power when it comes to the kingdom of God. And so it goes on to say in verse 14 of Psalm 71 and verse 7, but I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. In other words, a hope that is alive brings praises evermore. So you don't just praise, you continually praise. And it goes on to say here, yet more and more. There's something about praise when you're going through a trial. You should try it one day. When you feel overwhelmed and you can't take it no more, just sing to the Lord. Praise changes everything. And it doesn't matter how you sound, okay? You're like, some people might be like, well, I don't know how to sing. God's not up there like, you know, who sings that? And then you're like, well, you know, Crystal Lewis does. Well, let her sing it. No, God doesn't do that. You know, it's <laughs> the Lord, he'll accept your praise and he'll accept your worship and at times, listen, you might not even really be singing. You might just be with groanings and utterances to the point where the spirit takes over and then no man understands. But that's also praise and worship to the Lord. Try that for a moment. Begin to praise and begin to worship the Lord. Hey, and if, you're, if you really think that God has an issue with the way that you sing and you couldn't carry a tune if it had a handle, put a worship CD on and just worship to the music. It changes everything. So he says here, in the midst of his trial and his adversity, or whatever the case might be that he's facing, he says, I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness. Notice that. And your salvation all the day. His trial is causing him to focus on the righteousness of the Lord and the salvation of the Lord, not just for a moment. Notice what he's saying at the end of verse 15, all the day. 
What God has done for his people is limitless. What God has done for you is without limit. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. Well, we talked about that strength in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Did we not see that there? No. And notice what else we see here. It says, I will go in the strength of the Lord God. Well, the strength is the force and the might. There's an interesting passage found in the book of Matthew in chapter 11. And oftentimes it's been a passage that some people have had difficulty in trying to exposit. And most people that try to study that passage, at least most Bible students that I know, they pull out every commentary and every commentator they can actually pull out because they have difficulty trying to understand what Matthew chapter 11 verse 12 speaks of. And the passage states this in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12. It says, And the kingdom of God suffereth violence, but the violent take it by force. And some would say, well, I thought the kingdom of God was about peace and love. And it says that the violent take it by force. Well, the context really is that the kingdom of God suffers violence. Since the kingdom of God had been preached, where did the message of the kingdom of God begin and who did it begin with? John the Baptist. He was the first one to preach the kingdom of God is at hand. Remember that. And that was his message. And was he not met with violence? Weren't the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and all those totally opposed to John the Baptist and his message of the kingdom of heaven is at hand? And remember so much so that not only did he experience trials and personal uh, spiritual attack by the religious leaders, but he himself, John the Baptist, also experienced physical violence. Not only verbal violence, so to speak, but physical violence to the point where Herod killed him. So this is the whole message of the kingdom of God suffering violence. Well, this is the one. Now, when you look at the Luke's gospel in chapter 16, Notice that Luke gives his account of Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12. And what Luke says in chapter 16 and verse 16, he says that the kingdom of God suffereth violence. But what it goes on to say here is everyone is pressing into it. So this is what happens when it says the kingdom of God is suffering violence and the violent take it by force. We are violently going into it, so to speak. There is force, there is strength, and there is power. And though we might be making it in, we are making it in with the violence that is brought against it. And so we are pressing into it. So a proper rendition of Matthew chapter 11 in verse 12 could simply read that the kingdom of God presses ahead relentlessly and only the relentless press their way in. Like the enemy is relentless. We need to be relentless at bringing others into the kingdom of God. So when he says here in verse 16, I will, go into the strength, I will go in the strength of the Lord God, this is going in the strength of the Lord God. You need God's strength to continue on. Some of you need the strength of the Lord tonight. Some of you need a fresh touch from the Lord. Some of you need a fresh work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Some of you need to have that come to Jesus moment in your walk tonight. And you know what? Don't let church and Bible study be a routine and something you come to just to get your religious fix because that's not what this is about. It's about real people and a real God whose desire is to transform men and women to bring honor and glory to his name. He's a God who cares about every need and circumstance and trial and adversity that you're facing today and trials that you have no clue of that you're going to face in the future. And he's already over there on the other side, already resolved it, already worked it out. And you want to know what? Yeah, you got to go through it, but he's going to carry you all the way. And that's why it's important for us to know that the Lord is there for us. There's strength that we get from the Lord as we persevere and go through these very things. And so notice that the psalmist says, and I will go in the strength of the Lord. I will make mention of your righteousness of yours only. So notice one thing. It's hard to stay focused in trials, right? Sometimes we are very distracted. It's hard to stay focused. But notice this very thing that there's such difficulties that trials bring. And to stay focused really is more of a challenge than it is something easy for us to do. But we can stay focused through the strength of the Lord. 
but I've seen many lose focus in trials. Don't lose heart, man. Do not give up. Hold on. And you know what? I know at times what people might say. Trust me, I've been a pastor long enough and I've heard this, but you don't know what this trial is like. Your trial is no different than any other of the children of the Lord. This is just your trial. And if you think you're the only one going through it, which is the common idea or thought that the person that's going through a severe trial is like they're the only one out of all the Christians that have been bought and purchased by the blood of Jesus that are going through this trial. No, there are others that are going probably through the same, if not worse. The enemy likes to isolate us in our trials. If he can just get you by yourself, he can get you to focus on yourself. And if he can get you to focus on yourself in this trial, guess what? You're no longer focusing on the Lord, and there you go. You're backpedaling and spitting out of focus and out of control in your trial. And before you know it, not only is it the severity of the trial that's weighing you down, but also maybe the steps that you didn't take that you should have taken in this trial. And so trials are there to strengthen and sustain you. Trials are there to, for you to hold on to the Lord and be strengthened in the Lord. And, and so it goes on to say here that he'll go in the strength of the Lord and I will make mention of your righteousness of yours only. O oh God, you have taught me from my youth. And to this day I declare your wondrous works. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. I talked a little bit about this earlier, about the older teaching the younger. This should be a desire of every older person, and all of us here are older people. You're older than somebody else. And this really is the dynamic of the Christian, that the older shall teach the younger. And, and this is why this is so important in the life of every Christian. Notice what Psalm 48 and verse 13 says. It says, mark well her bulwarks. Consider her places, that you may tell it to the generation following. So you may tell it to the generation that is coming after you, that is following. Notice the whole purpose of this whole thing. That the people would know the city of Zion. That's the context of Psalm 48. But share it with generations to come. In Psalm 78, in verses 4 and verse 6 of Psalm 78, it says, We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He has done. That the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children. Notice that the whole entire emphasis is what? From generation to generation. In Psalm 79, in verse 13, once again, we see this very thing. Look, it's so we, your people and sheep of your pasture will give you thanks forever. We will show forth your praise to all generations. Psalm 102 also reveals to us this very same type of understanding in verse 18. And notice what it goes on to say here. This will be written for generation to come that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. Every generation, generation to come, this generation. And notice that every generation that comes after the one presently will know of this very thing. Psalm 145. Look at what else we see here. In Psalm 145 in verse 4, this is what it says in regards to teaching the next generation. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. So we see that God's heart and purpose and plan is for every generation. You're going to learn, and then what your job is to do is to teach the next generation. And you know, for some of us, we have more than one generation, even in our own households. And you might say, well, I really have no one younger than me. I mean, it's just me and my parents. Well, there's a generation right there. And some of us have more than one household, uh, one generation in our household. We have our parents, and then we have children, and then the children have children. And there you have two, three generations just in one house. Listen, 
The older shall teach the younger. And, and what is it that you shall teach them the ways of the Lord? And you want to know how people learn about God more than anything? Not by what you say, but how you live for him. The greatest witness is how you live for the Lord. Also, your righteousness, O God, is very high. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you? Notice as he's looking, he goes on to speak about the righteousness of God that is greater than man's righteousness. Jot down Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 24, Deuteronomy 3, 24, and Psalm 35 in verse 10. All this speak that the ways of God are very greater than the ways of man. Guys, you can't compare God's ways and man's ways. And notice what it says here. You Also, your righteousness, O God, is very high. You have done great things. The Lord's work on behalf of his people, have been great. In other words, what is he saying? You've done works greater than any man. And I love what he says here. Him just focusing on God's righteousness and how vast and how great his righteousness is draws him to ask this question, Oh God, who is like you? You know what the answer is? None. There's none like God. So by the great work of God, it brings him to draw this question as he's blown away by God's goodness. God, who is like you? You who have shown me great and severe troubles shall revive me again and bring me up again from the depths of the earth. Now, this is an interesting passage because when it says here, you have, or have, who have shown me great and severe troubles. In other words, all things in his life, were really ultimately in the hand of the Lord, but everything that he experienced, what he's saying is, Lord, you've allowed it. And this is hard at times for others to understand that perhaps the trial that you're walking through right now, ultimately, you know who pulled the trigger on that trial and allowed it to take place? The Lord. That's a hard one to swallow. But the Lord, seeing the trial coming your way, knew that it was going to come, and allowed you to be in the midst of this trial. And you're wondering, Lord, why? Now, it's not a sin to question God. Though we are nobody to question him. You're not going to go to hell if you ask God why. Or you're going to, you know, you blew it, that's it, you're out. You know that there's over 300 whys asked in scripture. Majority of those 300 are found just in the book of Job alone. Talk about trials. Talk about adversity. A great book to look through and go through. Check this out, guys. Listen. Though the questions have been asked over and over why, what really should be asked is, Lord, what? Why should what be asked when it should be why? Because it should always be, Lord, what must I learn in this? God obviously didn't stop it. He allowed you to go through it. And He's promising to be with you faithful as we see throughout these psalms. God has been with every psalmist in every circumstance and situation in their lives. And notice what he says here in verse 20. He says, you have shown me great and severe troubles. And then he says, you shall revive me again and bring me up again from the depths of the earth. Notice what he's saying. He's saying, listen, it doesn't matter how far these trials go. If I need to be revived, I know you're there to revive me. You know, sometimes, guys, I think trials serve not only the purpose of us putting our trust, our hope, and our faith in God, as we always should, but take note of this, too. I think trials also serve the purpose of us at times just needing to surrender our intellect to God. You know, because we're often the type of person that's always trying to figure God out and figuring out the situations and circumstances that we face in our lives. And sometimes what God really is working in you is saying, hey, stop trying to think this thing through because by you thinking it through, it's not going to get anything done. You need to have faith. You need to trust. I mean, consider probably one of the greatest trials, not the greatest, but one of the greatest trials in Scripture was Genesis chapter 22 when the Lord told Abraham, Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love and offer him as a sacrifice. So, so here's Abraham, now flung into this trial, right? 
And you can imagine the turmoil that he's going through. His son doesn't has no clue at all whatsoever of what was requested of him. Talk about a trial and a half. And yet he goes, and what does he do? He faithfully obeys everything, but I love what Abraham says. He tells his man as he gets everything prepared, and he goes, and he even goes to the very mountain that the Lord told him to go to. And at the base of the mountain, he looks to his, the men that were with him, that, that went with him, and what did he say? He said, me and the lad will be back. We're going to come back. Now, those men did not know at all whatsoever why Abraham was going to that mountain for and what he was going to sacrifice. And his son knew that there was going to be a sacrifice. And he didn't ask the question as to where the sacrifice was until they got to where they needed to get on the mountain. And then he's like looking around and he's like, well, well we got everything here. Where's the sacrifice? But what we do know in the book of Hebrews, the Bible says this. In Hebrews chapter 11, it says that when Abraham was tested in his faith, when, when Abraham was, was challenged in his faith was his son Isaac, his only son Isaac. And it wasn't that it was discrediting Ishmael, but Isaac was a son of promise. This was the one of promise. And, and the point that was being made there was that Abraham had to come to a place where, listen, God had moved mightily in his life and had done great and mighty things in his life. But what did Abraham have to surrender? Abraham had already surrendered all. He experienced great blessings from the Lord, did he not? And God had moved mightily already in Abraham's life. You think trials end after a while? They don't end. They continue to come. And let me tell you something. When God pulls you out of one of the greatest trials of your life, don't forget about it. Whew. Wipe off the sweat of your brow and think that there's no other tri trial. Guess what? If you thought that one was bad, there might be a greater trial ahead that you have no clue of. Understand that every trial is only preparing you for the next one. We lose sight of that. That was the worst thing I ever went through. Be prepared. There's more to come. And there are various trials, big and small. But trials will come. They all serve their purpose in preparation for the next one. So what I try to do, and I say try, is I try to learn what I need to learn from the trial that I'm in so I don't have to go through the lesson again. Because sometimes when you don't learn it the first time, it's going to take for you, perhaps some of you, more than one time. And you think just because the Lord brought you out, he probably brought you out because the Lord doesn't lead us into temptation. The Lord doesn't lead us to the place where we will falter and fall away. At times, the Lord delivers us from the trial. We think God has met the need, but perhaps the Lord is saying, you couldn't have gone on any further. It's my time to put it to an end now. You got to be very careful. Don't think you're the victor. Christ is. Be humble in the trial you've come out of and say it's only by the grace of God. And whatever the Lord will have for me ahead, I will put my trust in the Lord. So what did Abraham have to do when he was up there after facing? This, this is Abraham in his old age. What did he do? Well, I'll tell you guys what Abraham did. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 that Abraham knew that if he did, in fact, sacrifice Isaac, which would have been forbidden by the Lord to do because he doesn't do human sacrifice, that Abraham knew that the Lord would raise Isaac from the dead if he had to sacrifice him. What did Abraham do in this trial? What did he surrender? Oh, Lord, there's another part of me you want dead? No, this trial was great because Abraham had to surrender his intellect. It didn't make sense. It didn't add up. And he had to surrender everything of his intellect that he knew, what he questioned, what he thought he knew about God. The Lord was saying, you got to surrender all of that and just do what I say in the midst of this circumstance and situation in your life. So we see the Lord doing a great work, and he did it in the life of Abraham, and he so desires to do it in all of our lives. And this is why he says here in verse 20, you have shown me great and severe troubles, and you shall revive me again and bring me up again from the depths of the earth. You shall increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. This is the benefit of trials, guys, that what happens is that as time goes by, the Lord will continue to work on our behalf even in the midst of trials. And you want to know what? The longer you serve the Lord and the more trials you've been with, man, the Lord increases our greatness. The Lord increases our wisdom. The Lord increases our knowledge. The Lord increases 
our stamina in trials. Look at verse 22, 23, and 24 as we close tonight. The psalmist says, also with the lute, I will praise you. And your faithfulness, O oh my God, to you I will sing with the harp, O oh Holy One of Israel. Now, now remember how he's saying, O oh my God. This clearly goes to show that this man has a great understanding of the scriptures. Do you know that this term here, O oh Holy One of Israel, is only used three other times in the Bible? Because it's a term that's used only in one book of the Bible, and in that one book alone, it's used 30 times. It's a phrase that it's not used outside of that one book, but it's used here in Psalm 71 and verse 22, in Psalm 78, verse 41, and in Psalm 89, verse 18, because this is a very interesting term. Remember that there are various names that they would use for God to describe God, and this term here speaks of God has unapproachable light and covenant love meeting together. And this is unheard of among God's people, but remember in the book of the prophet Isaiah, the term, O Holy One of Israel, is used some 30 plus times in Isaiah. So what's the idea here? To, to you I will sing with a harp, O Holy One of Israel. In other words, you are a God who is a God of unapproachable light, but the covenant that you've made, your covenant of love, your loving kindness, other translations would say your loving kindnesses, meaning God's continual love, His covenant of love and His unapproachable light, His holiness and His covenant that He's made with man come together and they collide in the praises of man, kind of like the song that we sang, Heaven and earth become one in your presence. My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing to you, and my soul which you have, re and my soul which you have redeemed. My tongue also shall talk of your righteousness all the day long. In other words, this psalm and all that he's saying here as far as God meeting his need will be the very praises that comes from the fruit of his lips every single day. All of us have something to praise the Lord for today. I hope you do. Amen? Amen. All of us do. And I look at verse 24. For they are confounded, for they are brought to shame who seek my hurt. How did he start this psalm? I know that I will not be put to shame. How does he end this psalm? My enemies will be put to shame. Notice his confidence. Notice the very confidence that he has. Praise defeats the enemy, church. So tonight, let's praise the Lord. Let's praise him for his goodness. We might not understand. We might not know it all. And listen, God's not expecting you to do it and know it all. But the Lord is expecting us to trust him in the midst of it all.